الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا. We want to continue on with some of the practice that we've done with the hands wear dictionary. In several of our classes in week three, we've gone over how to identify the diacritical marks for or the harakat or the vowel signs for Arabic words in the hands wear dictionary. Uh, if you look at the page from the Handsware Dictionary in front of you, you'll see that all of the Arabic words there on the left uh, don't have any diacritical marks on them. And sometimes for a student using the dictionary, that can be a bit confusing. Uh, because, for example, if you look at the first three entries, which I'll point to with my mouse, uh, here, seen, jean, noon, seen, jean, noon, seen, jean, noon, then those three words from the basic appearance seem to be the same. So how do we differentiate when it comes to the pronunciation or the reading of those words? And if we're looking for a particular word that we do have the diacritical marks for, then how do we identify that word in the dictionary so that we can extract the proper definition? So that's what we went over in our week three lesson. Uh, using this same worksheet, but to benefit other students who are in the other classes that we didn't use this worksheet with, uh, we decided to present this in one of our videos so that everyone can have a chance to, to benefit from that information just in case they need it. Okay, so as we've mentioned as a beginning principle, uh, the authors of the Handsware Dictionary did not put diacritical marks on the Arabic words. Okay, maybe that was because of typing constraints. Uh, maybe it was because of time constraints. It would take too much time to do so. Under any circumstances, what they did do is they used English equivalents to represent uh, what was supposed to go on the uh, on the word, and they want you to be able to figure that out. Okay, so as a general rule, they use a after a letter to indicate that there's a fatah on it. They use I after a letter to indicate that there's a kesra on it, and they use U after a letter to indicate that there's a thumma on it. If between two consonants uh, there are no vowels, there's no A, there's no I, and there's no U, then that would indicate that there's a sukun on the first of those two consonants. And you'll see what I mean uh, as we go through the examples. All right? Now, we also said that the first entry in the Handsware Dictionary of a word will usually be a verb, okay? Every subsequent word after that that follows the same three-letter root uh, origin will be considered an ism, meaning that we can assume that the end of it has uh, bummatan at the end because that's the original rule for an ism that under normal circumstances, an ism will end with two lummas, okay? So, we'll now apply those general principles. So, we'll be repeating everything that we just said, so you don't need to go back uh, to the beginning of the video. We'll work through it practically now, uh, and then hopefully what we've mentioned will become clear. So, as we've said here, the first entry of the Handsware Dictionary for a word will usually, not always, will usually be a verb, okay? That's the general structure of the dictionary. We'll say about 90 to 95% of the time, the very first entry will be a verb or a fi'l. How will we know that? Well, the first way that we'll know is that all of the verbs in the Handsware Dictionary, they have a vowel as the last letter in the English spelling. So here you'll see S-A, which represents seen with a fatah, J-A, which represents jim with a fatah, and then N-A, which represents noon with a fatah. As we've already mentioned, isms don't end with fatahs under normal circumstances. So if there were going to be anything here after the N, if this was an ism, then it should be a U and an N to represent the un sound. Uh, the, the dhamma tan, the tanween with the dhamma. So the fact that there's an A back here uh, and not two dhammas or two, a letter indicating or letters indicating two dhammas 
is the first indication that this is not an ism. This is a fi'l. Next, we see a, 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 an individual uh, vowel, a vowel all by itself. That vowel by itself indicates what the middle letter would take in the present tense, okay? So, from sejana, the middle letter, or what we would call the ainul fi'l, is the jin. It's the middle letter, or the ain of the letter fa'ala. So, fa'ala uh, is the verb meaning to do. It is the verb from which fi'l comes from. And so, when we talk about letters in verbs, the first letter of any verb we refer to as the fa'ul fi'l, because fa is the first letter of fa'ala from which the word fi'l comes from. The second letter of any verb we refer to as the ayn of the verb, ayn al-fi'l. And so here jim is the ayn al-fi'l because it is the second letter. And the last letter of any verb we call the lam al-fi'l because lam is the last letter in fa'ala. And so the last letter of any verb we refer to as the lam al-fi'l. And so this vowel here indicates what the diacritical mark or the vowel mark will be for the ainul fi'l in the present tense. Okay? So sejana is the past tense. When we talk about normal verbs, when you see a verb for the first time or when you see it in the dictionary, it's in the past tense. In order to make it in the present tense, we have to add one of four letters to the beginning of the verb, which are captured in the acronym ANATE which is Hamza, Noon, Ya, and Ta. If a verb begins with any of these four letters, Hamza, Noon, Ya, or Ta, then it's considered to be in the present tense. So Sejana is the past tense. To put this in the present tense, normally we'll use a Ya. So we'll say, yes, we'll put a sukun on the Fa'ul Fil, yes, and then this indicates, the U indicates that there's a dhamma on the ainul fil, on that jim. So it would be yes, ju, and then at the end on that noon would be also a dhamma. The asl, the, the basic rule for a verb is that it, a present tense verb will end in a dhamma unless uh, there's a reason why not. So the present tense would be yes, junu. That's what this U here indicates. Now, in our accessible Arabic courses, we do not really deal with verbs, and especially not present tense verbs, until we get to book two. Right now, we're in book one, so that information about past and present tense verbs is of really no significance to you uh, at this present time if you are studying book one. So don't worry about that. The idea here is just that this isolated vowel here is an indication that this is what the ainul fi'l, this is the diacritical mark for the second letter in the present tense. That's how we know that this word is a verb. So that's the second indicator. The first indicator is that it ends with a vowel, with a diacritical mark with A, and the second one is this isolated vowel. The third indicator that this is a verb is that we have here a word in parentheses. This word in the parentheses is the gerund or noun form of the verb. So, sejnun is the noun form for sejana. So, sejana means to jail or imprison. So, sejin means uh, imprisonment or a detainment or jailing or imprisoning or so on. The last indicator that we'll see here is to. When you see to in a definition, that's the infinitive form of the verb, which strips the verb of any time reference. That's why it's called an infinitive, because infinitive uh, indicates that it is just non-ending. So it's almost as if we're stripping the verb of any time reference. The verb no longer refers to uh, the past, the present, or the future. So when you see two at the beginning of a definition, that indicates that that definition is a verb. Okay. So we know that this first entry is the verb. Once we see this space here, okay, this space means that we're moving between definitions. Everything else after this initial verb entry is an ism, which means that it ends in two lummas. Yeah, unless we're otherwise informed.
Okay? So, here we're now beginning with the ism. So the first entry is the verb or the fi'l with all or some of those indicators that we've already mentioned. Then we begin to move through isms. All right? Now, in order to identify the diacritical marks, again, we're going to have to look at the vowel signs that come after the consonants, after the letters, the non-vowel letters. So here we have an S. The S represents the seam. And then following the S, we have an A. That means that on the seam is a fatha. So we're going to represent that here. So I'll put my fatha up here. And there we go. So now we have a fatha on top of that seam. Okay? Then we have a J, which represents the gene. And then we have an N directly representing the noon. The fact that we have a consonant and a consonant, and we don't have an A or an I, or you in between them indicates that there's a sukun on the gene. So we'll go ahead and put our sukun up there. All right. And then we're left with the end representing the noon. And we said that because this is the ism, that the original rule is that there should be two dhammas on the end, even if they're not written. And because he's giving you ism after ism after ism, he's not going to keep writing two dhammas and two dhammas, un, 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 un. That should be understood. Okay, so this word here then is sejnun, 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 or taking that, the ending diacritical marks, the two dhammas off, because we don't pronounce those at the end of a sentence or the end of a word or the end of a phrase when we stop. Just like in Surah Al-Ikhlas, we say, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَد. Okay, if you read uh, the Mus'haf, the diacritical marks on Ahad is, Ahadun. Qul huwa Allahu Ahadun. But because we stop there, we say Qul huwa Allahu Ahad. And we don't say that un. So same thing here. We're going to say Sejin. And we're not going to say Sejnun because we're stopping here. But we know that there are two dhammas on there whether we write them or not. So our word here is Sejin. And Sejin means detention or imprisonment. Okay? So this is one noun of the verb and this is actually the noun form for the verb okay so sejin sejin we come to the second word and again the letters are the same but when we look at the english form we get to understand what those diacritical marks are so here we have sa which we said was a scene with a fatha here we don't have sa here we have si and we said that the i indicates a kesra so here, on our scene, we're going to put a kesra, okay? Same here, we have the J, which represents the gene, the N, which represents the noon. Between the J and the N, there's no A for a fata, there's no I for a kesra, there's no U for a dhamma. So that means that there is no vowel between the jim and the noon, which means that we're going to put a sukun on the jim. And so this word is sijin. So our first word was sejin, and this word is sijin. Okay? Now, we also see here pl with a period. That pl means that this word has a plural form. So sijin, not sejin, sijin has a plural which is sujun, which is sujun. And on sujun, on that second u, we see this elongation mark which we'll understand a little bit better uh, when we look at the next definition. A sijin is a prison or a jail. So this is a place where people are detained and imprisoned. And that's important to understand that sejin with a fatha is simply detention. And detention doesn't have to be in a place. It could be anywhere. A person could be detained in a police precinct. A person could be detained in one's house. A person, if he's not allowed to continue on the road and is stopped, for example, at a checkpoint, he could be detained on the road. He doesn't have to be or she doesn't have to be detained in an actual facility. But if there is a facility that's used for detention, then it's no longer sejin, it is sijin. Okay? So that's the slight difference that we have between these two words. Moving on to number three, 
we see S again, followed by an A. So that's just like our first one. So that's seen with a Fatah. So we'll go ahead and put that up there. Then we have J. Now this time, unlike the first two, the J actually has a vowel after it. The vowel after it is an I. That I am, it represents the Kesra. But after that I, or on top of that I, we see an elongation mark at the top. That means that that I, or that Kesra here, is going to be elongated. Now, the letter that elongates a Kesra is a Ya. And so, here we see, right after that Kesra, with the gene, we have a Ya. We don't need to do anything with that Ya, because it's elongation. Okay, and then we have the N, no diacritical mark after that, because this is an Ism. We know that there are two Dhammas uh, that are supposed to be there. So our word here is Sajinun. 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 And because this is the end of the word, or we're pronouncing the word in isolation, we don't need to pronounce those ending diacritical marks. So it would simply be Sajin. Sajin. Okay? Now, we see the PL here, which means that the word Sajin has a plural. The plural of Sajin, if we read here, is Sujana. Sujana. So here we see Sujana written. It also has another plural. So there are two plurals for this word. The second plural is Sajna. Sajna. Okay? Now, Sajin and Sujana and Sajna means imprisoned, jailed, or captive. Then we see this semicolon. We said whenever we see the semicolon, that the meanings or another definition is changing. They're giving us a second definition. So it can mean imprisoned, jailed, or captive, the adjective. Or it can also mean a person. It can mean an actual prisoner, a prison inmate, or a convict. So you can say, who was Sajin? Meaning, he is imprisoned. You are describing him. Or you can say, who was Sajin? meaning he is a prisoner. You are naming what he is. Okay? So, there we have number three, Sajin. We come down to number four, and we see that the two words, in Arabic and in English, are just about the same. The only difference here is that we have an A after the uh, N. Okay? When we look here, we have the S with an A, that means that the scene is going to have a fatah. Then we see a J with an I. That means the gene is going to have a kesra. We see the same elongation sign over the I, which means that that kesra is going to be elongated with a ya. Again, we see the N, and then after the N, we see an A, which means that that noon is going to have a fatah on it. We then see the ta. Tamarbuta, which indicates that this is a feminine form of the word that came before. So the word that we had before is Sajin. The word we have here is Sajina. Now, you're actually supposed to pronounce that ha sound, that Tamarbuta, at the end of a word. If we stop on that word, or we read that word in isolation, we don't pronounce the ta. So we would actually pronounce it as a ha, which would make this Sajina. But because that ha is so subtle, and because in pronunciation it's forgiven if it's not pronounced correctly, or it's not pronounced at all, then they haven't even bothered to write it here, because they don't want to confuse you by putting an H there, and you not knowing really how to say it, because it's a really hard sound to get out, Sejina. You know, it's, it's a hard sound to get out. So if you said Sejina, without that ha sound, you would be understood uh, by most people. But if you pronounced it with the dhammas on the end, then you would actually say Sajinatun. 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 But because we're pronouncing it in isolation, then we say Sajina. We then see PL, and then we have this hyphen, which means you're going to add something. Uh, and then we have the A with the elongation mark on top, which shows it's going to be a fatha uh, with a, uh, an aleph after it, and then a T which means that this Tamarabut is going to actually be dropped. We're going to put an Aleph after this Noon, and then we would put a Ta Meftuha, which is the normal Ta that we see. So the plural of Sajina would be 
Sajinat. Sajinat. With a ta meftuha. With the open, normal ta. Okay? Which would mean a female prisoner. It would also mean imprisoned, jailed, or captive if we were talking about a female. So we would say, Hia Sajina. She is imprisoned. Because remember that subjects and predicates, or the Mubtada and the Khabar, should agree in gender when they are individual words under normal circumstances. So we would say, Hia Sajina. She is imprisoned. Or we could say, Hia Sajina. And we could mean she is a prisoner or a convict or an inmate. We come down now to number five. Number five, we see the S and the A, which again indicates for us that the scene is going to have a fata on top of it. Now here we see something new, which is a doubled consonant. We see two J's there. Those two J's indicate that there is a shadda on the gene. You need the two consonants, whenever you see those, that indicates that that's a double consonant, okay, or the shadda in Arabic. Now, after that, we see an A, which means that on that gene, we're going to have a shadda and a fatha. Then we see the elongation sign on the A that indicates that that fatha is going to be elongated by the alif, okay? That's the elongation uh, letter for fatha, for the fatha. We said the elongation letter for a kesra is a ya. The elongation letter for a fata is alif. And then we have the in, which indicates a noon. And we know that that noon has two dhammas on it because this is an ism. So our word then would be sajanun. Sajanun. Okay, now because we're reciting this or we're reading this word in isolation, then we wouldn't need to pronounce those ending diacritical marks. So we would simply say sajan. Sajan, okay? Now, if you've been attending our classes, you'll know that Sajan is in the form Fa'al. Fa'al is, shows an occupation, someone who does the action as a job. So, our verb here is to jail and imprison. A Sajan would be someone who jails or imprisons people all the time or as an occupation, which would make that person a jailer a prison guard, or a warden. So that would be a sajan. Now, they didn't give us a plural, even though this is a person. Uh, the plural uh, would, for these types of words, if it's an occupation, would simply be a wow and a noon, or a ya and a noon. So the same th way you say Muslim, Muslimun, Mu'min, Mu'minun, for the occupation fa'al, form, the sajan, you would say sajanun. Allah says in Surah Al-Ma'idah, when he describes a certain group of people, he says, Samma'una lil kathibi akkaluna lil suht. Same form. Samma' yani always listening. Samma'una lil kathibi they always listen to lies. Akkaluna lil suht from akala, akil. And eating. So they're always eating uh, bribery, always taking uh, bribes and money that they should not be taking for the things that they do. Okay, the idea there is simply that the plural for words that are on the fa'al form, like sajan and sama and akal, is to put the wow and the noon, or if it's uh, in the mansub form or the majrur form, you would put a ya and a noon. The final word that we'll come to here uh, is uh, we have ac actually have a meme added here. So we have a m with a with an a, which means that there's a meme. The meme's going to have a fata after it, so we'll do that. Then we see the s, which is the sukun. I mean s, which is the scene, and the j, which is the gene. There's no vowel, no i, no a, no u in between them which means that the, uh, the, uh, the scene is going to have a sukun on it. So we'll go ahead and do that. Then the J is followed by a U. And so that means that the, the, the diacritical mark that is represented by the U is the dhamma. So we'll go ahead and put that up there. And then we, say the, we see the elongation mark there. Now the letter that elongates a dhamma is a wow. Now remember we saw that. The letter that elongates a kesra is a ya. The letter that elongates a fatah is an aleph. 
the letter that elongates a dhamma is a wow. And so we have the al, the wow added there. And then we have the in, which represents the noon. So our word is mesjunun. 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 Okay? And the plural of that is masajin. So we have two elongations there. Masa. So the scene has a fatah with an aleph. And then jin. The jim has a kestra followed by a ya. Masajin. Okay? And it says that the meaning of that is imprisoned, jailed, captive. Uh, then we have a semicolon, which means another meaning. Prisoner, prison inmate, and convict. So what we actually see here is that sajin and mesjun actually mean the exact same thing. Okay, so we have two words that mean the same thing. And that's not anything strange. Uh, for example, in English, a pupil, for actually what a pupil is, it's a part of one's eye. But it's also uh, that dilates, but it can also be a student. Uh, and student and pupil are the same words, even uh, same meaning, even though we use two different words for them. Okay? So with that, we conclude this lesson on diacritical marks. Uh, I do hope that that information is clear. You may need to watch the video a couple of times to be able to uh, let that information soak in. But it's important to read the English letters here to be able to distinguish what diacritical marks they're placing on the words as they do not use Arabic diacritical marks in the Hansware Dictionary. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this video uh, and have benefited from it. Uh, thank you very much for tuning in. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.